Good afternoon and welcome to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska, or excuse me, at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, my name is Ann Billisbach and I welcome you to this gathering today. Um, if you're interested in our brown bags or any of the other programs and activities that we have going on at the museum, you'll find all of that information on our website at www.nebraska.com history.org. Um, and before I introduce today's speaker, I want to say a special thanks to the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs uh, and um, you can view them on public access television or on YouTube. Today's speaker is Jim Potter, Senior Research Historian at the Nebraska State Historical Society. Jim has been on staff with the Society for more than a few years, um, first as a state archivist and then as editor of Nebraska History Magazine before moving into his current position here with the Historical Society. He's written numerous articles, given countless talks, many of them on Civil War topics. He edited, along with Edith Robbins, the letters of a Nebraska soldier, August Chernikow, that were published in 2007 by the University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, and the title of that book is Marching with the First Nebraska, A Civil War Diary. Uh, he is also, and I think this is uh, exciting, the author of a new book to be published in 2012 by the University of Nebraska Press titled Standling, Standing Firmly by the Flag, Nebraska Territory, the Civil War, and the Coming of Statehood, 1861 to 1867. The title of his talk today is Nebraska and the Civil War, Why the Story Matters. Please welcome Jim Potter. Thank you all for braving the weather. It's not quite as hot today, but I think it was still threatening a little rain. Um, just imagine spending the last few days in a wool Civil War uniform, camping with thousands of other men who haven't had a bath for days or weeks. But I'm not here today to talk about the fun side of the Civil War, or really much about the military side either. At first glance, it might seem that the American Civil War did not have much connection to the history of Nebraska. After all, Nebraska Territory had been in existence for barely seven years when the war broke out in 1861. Our then capital city of Omaha and the other small Missouri River settlements where most of Nebraska's 28,000 people lived were more than 1,100 miles from the wartime capitals of Washington, D.C. and Richmond. The closest Civil War battles of significant size took place in Missouri some hundreds of miles away. Most of the big battles occurred east of the Mississippi River in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Tennessee, so on and so forth. No gunboats plied the Missouri River along Nebraska's eastern shore, no towns were sacked within its borders, and the only Confederates to set foot here were enlisted from northern prison camps as Union volunteers to fight Indians in 1865. During the war years, Nebraska residents could not vote for president, and we had only a single non-voting delegate in Congress. Nevertheless, the Civil War's effects on Nebraska then and afterwards were very important. First of all, Nebraska's creation as a political entity was a key to the final breakup of the Union and the coming of the Civil War. Some historians have termed the act creating Nebraska and Kansas territories. And for Wayne Bowles, yes, I know it's the Nebraska-Kansas Act, but I'm going to call it the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Some historians have term, termed the act creating Nebraska and Kansas territories as one of the most fateful pieces of legislation in American history. There are the territories there. It was the latest in a series of political compromises designed to maintain a delicate balance of political power in Congress between the slaveholding and the free states. 
1820, 1850, and again in 1854, Congress tried to address the contentious issue of slavery in a way that avoided tearing the country apart. Missouri was admitted to the Union as a slave state and Maine as a free state in 1820, the so-called Missouri Compromise. At the same time, slavery was banned forever in the remaining lands of the Louisiana Purchase, including the area that would become Nebraska and Kansas. This ban did not seem very significant at the time because no one really thought this region, which the early explorers termed the Great American Desert, would ever really be settled by white Americans. This is actually uh, the map from Stephen Long's expedition in 1820, which uh, is labeled the Great Desert. I think you see it here, Great American Desert. You know, Nebraska, there's Nebraska right up here. In fact, this Great Desert region was envisioned to be uh, best use of the permanent Indian Territory. However, the Mexican War of 1846-48 gained the nation much new territory in the southwest and on the west coast. And I realize this isn't an 1840s version of, of, of the United States, but it shows the different localities pretty well. The California gold rush followed along with the continuing flood of immigration to the Pacific Northwest that prompted both California and Oregon to seek statehood before the Civil War. In 1850, California was admitted to the Union as a free state and the territories of New Mexico and Utah, which were lands acquired by the Mexican War, were organized. Because the latter two territories were not subject to the slavery ban imposed by the Missouri Compromise, Southern interests were placated by allowing the people in New Mexico and Utah, of which there weren't very many, to decide whether to allow slavery there under the doctrine of popular sovereignty. At the same time, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act, which required escaped slaves to be returned to their masters no matter where the slaves had taken <coughs> refuge. This act, of course, was very unpopular in the North. Western land acquisitions such as these made it inevitable that Americans would soon also occupy the mid-continent region, the so-called permanent Indian territory. As early as 1844, Illinois Congressman Stephen A. Douglas had begun promoting organization of a Nebraska territory west of the Missouri River. By 1854, now Senator Stephen A. Douglas and other Illinois and Iowa politicians made organization of a Nebraska territory, which of course was later divided into Nebraska and Kansas, as a priority. This new territory would provide a central route for the Transcontinental Railroad, for a Transcontinental Railroad that would benefit the Midwestern states and connect the rest of the nation to the West Coast. Southern representatives in Congress, of course, resisted the creation of any such new territory because slavery would be banned there under the 1820 Missouri Compromise. In order to gain Southern support for organizing Nebraska, Douglas decided to handle the slavery issue under the principle previously applied to New Mexico and Utah, popular sovereignty. <laughs> Doing so, he believed would remove the debate over slavery's extension into the West from national politics and make it a local issue. He did not think slavery, a labor system underpinned by plantation ag agriculture, could be viable in the West. Douglas's plan, however, could only work if the Missouri Compromise were repealed because, as I said, the former act imposed an outright ban on slavery in the region that Douglas wanted organized as the new territories. By inserting repeal of the Missouri Compromise as the key part of the Kansas-Nebraska bill, or the Nebraska bill, Southern senators and congressmen voted in favor of organizing Nebraska and Kansas. Now Douglas had badly miscalculated how his new compromise would be received. Many in the North, which already had a strong abolition movement, considered the Missouri Compromise virtually sacred. Outrage at its repeal based on fears that slavery would now spread into the West, sparked the rise of the new Republican Party. Many in the North had also believed that slavery would, also, would ultimately die out altogether if it could be confined to the South. 
This is what Abraham Lincoln had hoped. The Kansas-Nebraska Act re-energized his political career and brought him to national attention as one of the Republicans' principal spokesmen on the slavery issue. We, are, of course, are familiar with his debates with Senator Douglas during the 1858 Illinois Senate campaign and Lincoln's famous statement that a house divided against itself cannot stand. We should also remember that repeal of the slavery ban and the substitution of popular sovereignty sparked violence in Kansas over which faction would gain control there. Bleeding Kansas in the 1850s kept the battle over slavery in the headlines. Then abolitionist John Brown tried to launch a slave insurrection with his 1859 raid on the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, for which he was soon hanged. The 1857 Dred Scott ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court that said slaves were private property and could be taken anywhere by their owners also further divided North and South. Many Southerners believed that if the Republicans accomplished their goal of stopping slavery from spreading as new territories and states were organized, then slavery was doomed. The addition to the union of more and more free states would certainly mean that the slaveholding states would inevitably become a political minority, raising the, the prospect that Congress might someday ban slavery nationwide. Oregon, as we saw earlier, had already been admitted to statehood. I think their date was 1859, without slavery. And then when Republican Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860 almost exclusively by northern votes and on a platform pledged to stop slavery spread, southern fears seemed confirmed. Although Lincoln and most Republicans were not yet calling for slavery's outright abolition, the election's outcome along with strident abolition sentiment in the North seemed a direct threat to the South's cherished institution. Therefore, secession and civil war soon followed in 1861. An immediate effect on Nebraska from the election of 1860 was Republican political, politi political control of the territorial government. Under the territorial system, the governor, the judges, the Indian agents, land office officials, and other functionaries were appointed by the administration holding power in Washington, D.C. Previously, these offices in Nebraska had been filled by Democrats because the Democrats controlled the White House. But Democratic President James Buchanan's resistance to a Homestead Act and his pro-slavery sentiments, among other policies, caused many Nebraska Democrats to join the Republican Party here. In 1860, Republicans won control of the Nebraska legislature, which was, in fact, elected by the people of Nebraska. And with the national election uh, resulting as it did, President Lincoln then appointed Republicans to all the territorial offices. This is Governor Alvin Saunders, whom Lincoln re uh, appointed governor of Nebraska territory, and Saunders served throughout the years of the Civil War from 1861 all the way through Nebraska statehood. In 1861 as well, the Nebraska legislature passed a bill to abolish slavery in Nebraska, which had been legalized in 1854 by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This bill was a somewhat symbolic in that Nebraska had, I think in 1860 by the census, only 15 slaves within our borders, uh, most belonging as servants to officers stationed at Fort Kearney or uh, a few uh, uh, servants of prominent uh, entrepreneurs in Nebraska City, such as uh, the freighting king, Alexander Majors, and some other folks who had, had migrated to Nebraska from the Mid-South or possibly even farther east. So slavery was not a, a major, major operation, certainly in Nebraska. Once the war broke out, the Civil War, in eight, April of 1861, it had other effects here in Nebraska. First, it slowed immigration as many men who might have come west instead joined the Union and the Confederate armies. Nebraskans, too, who otherwise would have stayed here to farm, uh, operate businesses, or 
conduct other kinds of economic activity, enlisted in the Union Army, more than 3,000 Nebraskans eventually. A few Nebraskans returned south to serve the Confederacy. At the same time, the federal troops garrisoning Forts Laramie, Fort Kearney, and Fort Randall, all of which were then in Nebraska territory, were withdrawn for the big war in the east, sparking great fears here at home of an Indian outbreak, which didn't come in 1861, but in fact did come in 1864. During the war years, only a handful of soldiers were stationed in Nebraska to protect the settlements, the Overland Telegraph and Stagecoach routes, and the immigrants who were still moving across the plains. Oops. The already struggling Nebraska economy was also harmed when Missouri River steamboat traffic slowed due to Confederate guerrilla activity in the border state of Missouri and by the diversion of many steamboats to supply and transport Union forces in the Western Theater, both on the Missouri and the Mississippi <coughs> rivers. With the closest railroad to Nebraska terminating at St. Joseph, Missouri, steamboats were of course the main way that commodities and people arrived in or departed from Nebraska territory. As a territory, Nebraska depended heavily on federal funding for internal improvements such as roads and bridges and to support government operations such as the expense of the legislative sessions, conducting land surveys, operating the Indian agencies, and even maintaining the Capitol building in Omaha. Most of this funding dried up due to the war, due to the heavy expenses of, of fighting the Civil War. Congress even levied a war tax on northern states and territories, including Nebraska, that would further deplete the almost empty territorial treasury. Samuel G. Daly, who was our delegate in Congress, he managed to convince his fellows that instead of appropriating the, the, the $20,000 for each year's uh, legislative session, Congress would just defer that money, just not send it to Nebraska and count that against our, our $19,000 war tax. So that's what happened. As a result, there was no session of the Nebraska legislature in 1863. And while not having a session of the legislature might seem a blessing in today's political environment, <laughs> the diverted appropriation that never got here represented about 20,000 federal dollars that never flowed into the Nebraska economy, which was already pretty weak. Now the war did spur some migration across the Missouri River into Nebraska, but the newcomers were not always the sort of immigrants that would either help us grow and thrive or the kind of immigrants we wanted to live here. Many were actually army deserters or draft dodgers, and others were simply fleeing the war from Missouri and other places where there was a lot of, uh, a lot of internal fighting and guerrilla warfare. Most of these people who came across for those reasons did not intend to make Nebraska their home. Just while I'm thinking of it, here's the, here's the uh, Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad across northern Missouri. That was the only railroad reaching the Missouri River uh, at the time of the Civil War uh, up here. And then, of course, here's Omaha and so on. Nebraska territory was considered a haven for people like draft dodgers and deserters because Nebraska was never subject to federal military conscription acts that applied to states east of the Missouri River. That was primarily because Nebraska had already furnished such a large percentage of her men to the Union Army. Uh, about a third of the total number of military aged men that were enumerated by the 1860 census. There was also a transient population coming in of would-be miners that were flowing through Nebraska en route to gold mines in Colorado, Montana, and Idaho. But they were here too briefly to contribute much to building the territory or its institutions. Now there were some benefits from this gold migration, if you will, because obviously most of these gold fields were being supplied by overland freighting that started from the towns along the Missouri River. But the people themselves were off for the gold fields and just used Nebraska as a highway to get there. What Nebraska needed and could not count on until the war was over 
was an influx of individuals and families who came to stay. Only then would the territory gain the population and the political and economic stability to justify statehood. On the positive side, the war prompted federal legislation that held great promise for Nebraska's future if the Union were to win the war. It included the Pacific Railroad Act, the Homestead Act, and the Morrill Land Grant College Acts, all passed in 1862. Before the war, Southern representatives in Congress had blocked such measures, which they felt would only promote settlement in the West by those opposed to slavery. However, secession of the Southern states enabled the remaining Republican majority in Congress to pass these measures without difficulty, and President Lincoln was happy to sign them. In 1863, Lincoln selected a route through Nebraska's Platte Valley for the Transcontinental Railroad with Council Bluffs, Iowa designated as its eastern terminus. This decision ensured that Omaha would become Nebraska's metropolis, although construction of the Union Pacific did not actually begin until 1865 after the war was over. The Homestead Act of 1862 took effect January 1st, 1863, but it didn't have much impact while the war still raged. Many of those who might be interested in taking advantage of the Homestead Act were serving in the Union Army. The Morrill Land Grant College Act, which granted public land to endow state agricultural colleges, could not be implemented here in Nebraska until we became a state. As you mostly know, the, uh, the University of Nebraska was, was not established till 1869. And that's the University of Nebraska, the whole thing, 1869 or so. Nevertheless, the passage of these several acts by a Republican Congress and a Republican president bolstered Republican control of Nebraska territorial politics during the war years and would help, keep, help them keep control once the war was over. Other Union war policies also helped shape Nebraska politics in ways that persisted. Initially, Nebraska Democrats supported President Lincoln's goal of putting down the rebellion and keeping the Union intact. The Democratic view, however, was that the war was being fought only to preserve, quote, the Constitution as it is and the Union as it was. In other words, the war should not interfere with slavery or state sovereignty. Hence, Democrats, Democrats in the North, including many in Nebraska, were highly critical of Lincoln's 1863 Emancipation Proclamation and his decision that same year to enlist black men in the Union Army. Both measures designed to strengthen the Union war effort and to weaken the Confederacy. Democrats in Nebraska and elsewhere felt that these measures went far beyond simply preserving the Union as it existed before the war. Some Nebraska Democrats and Nebraska Democratic newspapers violently attacked Lincoln and the Republicans and even skirted per perilously close to outright sympathy for the South. One outspoken Nebraskan was none other than J. Sterling Morton, and his criticism of the president and union war policies helped ensure that he was never elected to a high public office in Nebraska, though he often sought one. The Civil War and its aftermath also played an important part in Nebraska Territory's transition to statehood in 1867. Nebraskans had first considered statehood in 1860, but voted down a proposal to call a constitutional convention. By 1864, with, with the Republicans firmly in control, they began urging statehood so that Nebraska could get its full representation in Congress and also perhaps even come in in time to vote in the 1864 presidential election. They also, the Republicans also felt that if they could become a state while they were in charge, they would, they would probably keep that control during the early statehood period and have a lot to do with, sh with shaping the new state of Nebraska. The Democrats here in Nebraska, however, didn't really think they had much chance of, of winning a state election or winning the offices for, for a new state government. So they argued that statehood would be too expensive. After all, as a territory, the federal government was paying most of the bills here in Nebraska. 
And if we became a state, then the taxpayers in Nebraska would have to pay for the costs of a state government. This argument turned out to be successful, and uh, even though Congress passed a, a Statehood Enabling Act for Nebraska in 1864, and subsequently Nebraskans elected delegates to a constitutional convention to write a constitution, when they assembled, they had all been pledged to adjourn without doing anything, and that's what they did. Went home. When the statehood question next came up early in 1866, after the war was over, the Republicans and the territorial officials in charge used dubious methods to write a constitution and get it adopted. Instead of holding, holding a formal convention, the officers simply drew up a constitution that was then hastily passed by the legislature for submission to the voters. To avoid the previous argument that statehood would burden the taxpayers, the new constitution provided a mere outline for a state government and ridiculously low salaries for its officers. This slipshod constitution, narrowly adopted at a June 2nd, 1866 election, would haunt Nebraska's early statehood years and help stifle effective government, even requiring the drafting of a new constitution in 1875. Forgot to show you Morton. Another feature of the 1866 Constitution that connected to the war and wartime issues was that it authorized only white men to vote. This is a page from the original 1866 Constitution you see right there. Uh, the, it describes the electors and they include white citizens of the United States and white persons of foreign birth who have uh, declared their intention to become citizens. This provision was typical of most northern state constitutions of the day, which probably helps to explain in part why it was included in Nebraska's. And despite the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that abolished slavery in December 1865, Nebraska's constitution makers and Nebraskans generally probably had no great sympathy for giving civil rights to black Americans, former slaves or not. In reality, in 1866, there were hardly any black people living in Nebraska. Not, nevertheless, the Nebraska statehood question and the issue of equal suffrage got caught up in the post-war battle between the president and radical, re radical Republicans in Congress over the reconstruction of the former rebel states. Lincoln's assassination put Vice President Andrew Johnson in the White House. As a Democrat, a former slaveholder, and a committed white supremacist, Johnson had no love for the former slaves or any real interest in granting them civil rights. He had demonstrated as much when he authorized several of the former Confederate states to write new constitutions in preparation for their return to Congress. President Johnson proclaimed that only white men could participate in that process. He wanted to readmit the southern states and then let them decide how to manage their internal affairs on their own. Now the radical Republicans in Congress insisted that black men in the South must be given the vote to prevent the return to political power of the ex-Confederates. If the former rebels regained control of the new Southern state governments, they would surely keep the freed slaves in a condition of quasi-bondage. When President Johnson vetoed several congressional acts designed to help protect the freedmen from their former masters, the radical Republicans in Congress believed that the president was enabling the South to achieve politically what it had failed to win by war. Now, when Nebraska's constitution showed up in Congress with a whites-only voting restriction, the radicals were, were outraged. Here was a northern Republican-controlled loyal territory seeking admission to the Union under conditions that the radicals had already refused to concede to the former rebel states. Congress therefore amended the Nebraska Statehood Admission Act by imposing what they called the fundamental condition. 
And that condition was before Nebraska could be admitted as a state, the state legislature would have to disavow the whites only voting clause in the state constitution. So the legislature assembled in a special session in February of 1867. That was their only item of business. They promptly voted to disavow the whites only voting clause, which then with the bill already passed in Washington, then President Johnson, as every fourth grader knows, proclaimed Nebraska the 37th state on March 1st, 1867. There was a little more to it than that because through this process, Congress established a strong precedent for the future readmission of the former Confederate states and signaled that from then on, it was going to be Congress and not the states who would set the requirements for suffrage and other civil rights. This shift also helps explain the crafting of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that granted citizenship to the former slaves and included the Equal Protection Clause, as well as the 1870 adoption of the 15th Amendment that made equal suffrage a, const a constitutional requirement everywhere, including in the former Confederate states. While the 15th Amendment prohibited denying the vote on the basis of race or previous condition of servitude, as you know, the southern states found several ways to frustrate the amendment's intent during the era of Jim Crow. They simply imposed property or literacy requirements that many former slaves could not meet. If you want to see the, a facsimile of our first state constitution, it's upstairs just above us here in the, in the Nebraska Joins the Union exhibit. And as I showed in the slide, the original document or the facsimile of the original document still includes that whites, whites only clause. Uh, the legislature's assent to the fundamental condition of, imposed by Congress simply made that section of the, the written document null and void. So nobody ever went back and erased it or whited it out. I guess you couldn't white it out in those days. <laughs> So it's still in the, in the Constitution, even though it doesn't have any effect. As far as I know, Nebraska is unique as the only state that Congress required specifically to grant equal suffrage to African-American men before the adoption of the 15th Amendment in 1870. And this role that we played in this post-war battle over black voting rights underpins our state motto which is on the state seal, equality before the law, which both seal and motto were adopted by the legislature in June of 1867, just a, a few months after we became a state. Because the Democratic Party had the reputation as the party of secession, simply because most of the Confederate states had been heavily Democratic, and it was really the Southern Democrats who led the secession movement, and because many Democrats in Nebraska had opposed Republican war policies and resisted statehood and continued to advocate denying civil rights to African Americans, no Democrat was elected to a statewide office here until 1890. In part, this failure was due to the thousands of Union veterans who came to Nebraska after the war to claim land under the Homestead and other land acts. These veterans became a potent political force, ready, as they said, to, quote, vote as we shot, which means they voted to support the Republican Party. And many of those party leaders were the same territorial officials that had served during the war or also had been uh, officers or, or other um, members of the Union Army. The 1890 federal census records nearly 23,000 surviving Union veterans living in Nebraska. The Republicans dominated Nebraska politics for decades, regularly controlling the legislature and winning the governorship and the seats in Congress. The impact of the Union veterans can also be seen in the several counties created after the Civil War that are named for Union generals. Grant, Hooker, Howard, Logan, Thomas, McPherson, Sheridan, Thayer, and Sherman. And somebody's going to say, you forgot Custer. Well, Custer was a general in the war, but I think that name was applied more for his little bighorn 
you know, Indian War exploits because Custer County was formed in the 1880s. So anyway, that's my, my thought. It's probably more for his Indian War period, but he was indeed a Union general. We also have counties named for the, some of the big Union political leaders, Stanton, Seward, Lincoln himself. While the capital relocation from Omaha to Lincoln in 1867 resulted more from long-standing sectional rivalries than to the Civil War directly, the new capital city's name, of course, and its role as the home of the Landgraf University have clear wartime connections. Most of Nebraska's U.S. Senators and Congressmen in the years before 1890, as well as many of the governors, were Civil War veterans. And if one did a study of the biographies of the members of the Nebraska legislature in those years, you would no doubt find scores of Civil War veterans. Again, I think that's one reason we have these counties named after generals. Certainly, uh, in politics, a personal connection to the army that saved the Union and freed the slaves would have been a significant advantage if you were in a race against the Democrat from the so-called party of secession, particularly at a time when many of the actual voters were themselves former Union soldiers. Most Nebraska towns had a post of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Union Veterans Organization. I think more than 350 such posts altogether. A few of their meeting halls, such as the one here in Nebraska City, still stand. This one is a museum. And if you go to any cemetery in Nebraska, you'll probably be likely to see a Civil War Veterans Memorial, graves of Civil War veterans. Uh, also, you'll often see these memorials on courthouse lawns. No different in Nebraska than Iowa or any other of the Union states. Another important legacy of the Civil War is its connection to the fate of the native peoples who had called Nebraska home before the white man came. Although there had been some conflict with the Nebraska Indians earlier, the warriors brought extended warfare. Gold rushes in Colorado, Idaho, and Montana during the 1860s brought whites flooding through the Platte Valley, increasingly encroaching upon prime Indian hunting grounds. The opening of the Bozeman Trail through present-day Wyoming to the Montana mines was a particular irritant. The Bozeman Trail kind of went from Fort Laramie right up through what's today Wyoming along the Bighorn Mountains and over to the gold camps of of uh, Montana. Army campaigns in Dakota in 1863 and 1864 against Minnesota Sioux who had revolted and then fled west fanned hostility and also drove many Indians south to the Platte Valley region. The Indian War of 1864 began in August with attacks by Cheyenne, Sioux, and Arapahoes Attacks, extend, attacks extending from the Little Blue River east of Fort Kearney and all along the Platte west to Julesburg. Indian resistance was hardened by outrages such as the infamous Sand Creek Massacre when Colorado volunteers slaughtered a village of friendly, friendly southern Cheyennes in the fall of 1864. That right there. Not only did this fighting divert troops and resources from the Civil War in the East, it brought loss of life and economic disruption to Nebraska. The Indian War on the Plains that continued in 1865 and 1866 set the stage for the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, setting aside a great Sioux reservation in Dakota, including the Black Hills. This giant reservation, as well as smaller reserves created in Nebraska in the 1850s and 1860s would not long remain untouched by the increasing Great Plains settlement brought on by railroad construction and the Homestead Act. The 1870s brought more warfare between Indians and whites and more persistent calls to remove the Indians to ever, ever smaller reservations farther and farther away from lands the whites coveted. Even peaceful tribes such as Nebraska's Poncas Pawnees and Otos stood in the way. Uh, this map actually shows the various Indian land sessions in Nebraska uh, beginning and even before the territory in some cases. By the late 1870s, well, I've been there already, I'm sorry. 
Although the subjugation and removal of the Nebraska Indians had started before the Civil War, the war years accelerated the process and made the final outcome inevitable. While Nebraska was distant from the major battlefields and furnished only a small number of soldiers in comparison with most other states, the Civil War was a watershed event with major consequences for our social, political, and economic development. As such, it constitutes an important and fascinating chapter in our history, a chapter that makes the current Civil War sesquicentennial a meaningful anniversary that all Nebraskans should take note of. Take note of it, but if you don't want to pronounce it, that's okay. <laughs> At least that's my view, and that's actually what prompted me to write a book which is at least tentatively entitled Standing Firmly by the Flag, Nebraska Territory, the Civil War, and the Coming of Statehood, which, as Ann indicated, is scheduled to be out from the University of Nebraska Press in about a year or so. So, I'd be happy to take some questions if we have them. Uh, Ron. Uh, in my history <clears throat> class in the mid-70s with Fred Lukey, is, uh, he prominently said that uh, the uh, Daniel Friedman was actually a Secret Service agent who uh, went to uh, scout northern Kansas for the U.S. government, and he just skipped right into the land office at midnight, and him and actually two other people also did the same thing. But uh, they don't seem to like that at the Homestead Monument uh, story. The question was uh, about Daniel Freeman, who's credited as the first homesteader who allegedly was a Army Secret Service agent or some such who happened to be in Nebraska when the Homestead Act took effect at the stroke of midnight on January 1st, 1863. So he he got the land agent at Brownville at the office, land office to open up and he filed his claim and therefore he's the first homesteader. He's certainly one of the first homesteaders, there's no dispute about that. Every land office across the country had a, a you know, claim number one and whether he actually is a few minutes earlier or later than some of these other number one claims. There were several people that did file right after midnight. His military service is a little more problematic. I've tried to find verification that he served in some Illinois unit. I've never been able to prove or to find anything. I, I think Homestead National Monument has been trying to. So it's a, it's a nice story and it may be true, but I don't think anybody's really established what Daniel Freeman's military record was at this point. And I'm gonna let the Homestead National Monument people continue that, that effort because after all, he's their icon. There was some, I thought I saw another hand, but if not, I'm, okay, Ron, you get. Um, uh, Rosencrantz was uh, encouraged to leave the field of battle at Chickamauga uh, by one of his aides. Was that Garfield or Harrison? And, and that who later became president. Uh, that well, they both later became president, I know that. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So I was wondering about your, your list of counties that are listed for Civil War. Uh, maybe it was breveted. Uh, well, here's here's the way I will explain that. Yes, the, the question was there were some other there were some other names on the county maps that were obviously Civil War veterans uh, or even maybe Civil War officers. But my I guess my point was they were probably those counties, given when they were established, were probably named because of, that guy was president by that time or it may not have been exclusively maybe for his, and even Grant County for that matter might have, who knows whether they were naming it for General Grant or President Grant. So I, I took the view that people like Harrison, you know, the town of Harrison and, and that sort of thing, it probably was named for President Harrison, but probably because he was president and not because of his Civil War connections. And I just haven't really dug into that far enough to know, and probably it isn't important enough to do anyway. Yes? How did we end up with the unicameral? The unicameral? Well, that came along really in the 1920s and 30s, and it's largely uh, uh, promoted by Senator, U.S. Senator George Norris. Um, I can't think of any, at least offhand, of any connection it might have to the Civil War exactly. It's, it's a, a 20th century. 
innovation designed theoretically at least to streamline government, make it more accountable, and, in, and reduce the influence of lobbyists. So I don't know if it, it has, it has those, those arguments at least. Wayne. Uh, Jim, in the picture of Abraham Lincoln, vice president, I thought that chair looked familiar because I lived at the same time Matthew Brady was in existence. Was that in his, was that picture taken in Matthew Brady's studio? I, the question was the, the photo of uh, President Johnson seated in a chair and uh, uh, the question was whether that picture was taken in Brady's, Matthew Brady's studio in Washington and the answer I have is I don't know. I, I think I got that photo from some source that may have, may not have attributed the photo might it could ver very well have been um, is a studio portrait for sure but I don't know the answer uh, well, let's try that um, any other interesting stories or connections I grew up in Kansas uh, you know familiar with the, with the, uh, the quattro raid on Lawrence uh, are there, were there activities or, or differences of, of opinion because of allegiances uh, that played out, you know, not necessarily in battle form, but in other uh, areas throughout the Nebraska territory. Well, first, the question was: Was there anything um, similar to Bleeding Kansas, I guess, or the or the the battles and the sacking of Lawrence and Quantrell's raid, anything like that here in Nebraska? Certainly, before the war we didn't have the contentiousness and the violence that uh, that Kansas had. We were mostly arguing about where the capital should be and uh, it was, you know, there was voting fraud and stuff here too, but nothing that really uh, ended up in bloodshed. During the war itself, there was some pretty uh, outspoken rhetoric on both sides of the aisle and uh, the editor of the Nebraska City News, who was a, a, a Democrat and had nothing good to say about Lincoln, was caught uh, stamping on the stars and stripes in the mud of uh, the Main Street one day in 1863 or 64 and hauled off to answer. I, mean, I think it, they let him loose when he took the oath of allegiance or something. But so there was this kind of you know infighting. But as far as the only, there was no you know Confederate raids, no really guerrilla warfare. The Indians, I mean, clearly they they were the guerrillas, uh, the partisans that we fought here. And we never had a town destroyed, although if, if you look just across the border, the Indians sacked Julesburg twice in 1865 within a month of each other. Julesburg is hardly dignified by the name of a town, but you know, he had some buildings, a telegraph office and stuff. So our, our activities here is in terms of military activities were primarily related to Indian, Indian events. Mm, not back in the back. Right? Jim, you mentioned the sesquicentennial. I think it's uh, significant to point out that 150 years ago, right now, the very first major battle of the Civil War was taking place. Today. Today. First Bull Run. Bull Run. And you know, I, I used to know all those dates, and, and this one is one I'm surprised I forgot because today's also my brother's birthday. <laughs> and that's how I always remembered it, but I obviously forgot it today. I think I had a question, yes, there first. So, the, the, would you say that the, one of the major effects of the Civil War on Nebraska is that today and in the past we are a Republican state? The question was, would, would I say that the Civil War had an effect on Nebraska being a Republican state today? I guess I'd shy away from making too much of a, drawing too much of a conclusion from something so far away. Uh, the, the parties are a lot different than they were, you know, in, in the Civil War years for one thing. But certainly Nebraska started out as a Republican state, so I suppose just some momentum might have carried over. And see, the one thing that's always been interesting to me is that the, in, in the Civil War years, the Democrats were the conservatives and the Republicans were the liberals. So it flopped uh, over, over time. Uh, curiosity, how many audience members present have ancestry that they can trace to the, uh, the question the was, how many audience members can trace to a, a directly to a Civil War ancestor? 
Well, I'm not going to count them, but there's probably at least half or more of the audience for sure. I, I can put my hand up too. <laughs> we have another question right there. So, yeah, would you comment on the uh, effect of allegiances to the north and the south as uh, the state went through the decision on relocation of the capital? Well, that was a battle between north and south, but it was a battle between north of the plat and south of the plat. <laughs> And it really didn't have much to do with, if anything, with the Civil War because Democrats living south of the Platte and Republicans living south of the Platte both wanted the capital south of the Platte and vice versa. So um, it was, it was kind of a, a, a reprise of that business in 1859 when the counties south of the Platte in, in territorial days wanted to attach to Kansas. And we even sent a delegate, those counties even sent a delegation down to the Kansas legislature and said, we'd like to have you annex us to Kansas so Kansas would include all of Nebraska up to the Platte River. But of course, Kansas didn't want to do that, and I don't think they could have done it legally anyway, so it fell through. But Did that have any effect on the naming of uh, the new capital of Lincoln? Well, there's a story that goes around that some, I think he was an Omahaan who didn't want the capital to move and also a Democrat, and he knew that there were other Democrats on the, the other side that wanted the capital to move south, so he thought maybe if, this is the story anyway, that if he if he floated the name of Lincoln, that the Democrats from south side of the Platte, south of the Platte would, oh no, we can't do that, but they were so happy to, they wanted the capital so bad that you could have named it after, you know, the devil himself probably, as long as they got it. So that's a story, I don't know if it's completely confirmed or not. John Brown's cave in Nebraska City, was there actually an underground of some sort that uh, tr some number of slaves moved from Kansas to Nebraska? Is there anything to that? I have done quite a bit of research on that subject, actually, and while there's good documentation that there were actually some black people at, in the cabin at one or two times, perhaps, and the the brother of the wife of the man who owned the cabin was actually with John Brown as a part of his party and was killed at Harper's Ferry. The son who lived there, the, the, the son who lived with that family said there, there was never any slaves in the cellar and that, that cellar didn't actually connect over to the creek bank. It was a storage cellar. So I think there's certainly there's certainly some credence to, to some activity with regard to the Underground Railroad, but I think some of it over the years has gotten mythologized because you can read accounts from, say, the 1920s when you had boatloads of slaves crossing the Missouri River you know, every day, and this was, of course, the local newspaper's approach to it. It wasn't documented or anything. So the answer is yes, there was some activity, but it's hard to know exactly what went on. But you can't dismiss that there was some connection to the Underground Railroad. Um, I wonder if you could clear up, I, I seem to recall Abraham Lincoln buying property in Council Bluffs or campaigning in Council Bluffs? He did speak, the question was about Abraham Lincoln in Council Bluffs and he did come to, to Council Bluffs before the war, uh, met with uh, Grenville Dodge who um, had a I think Lincoln was trying to find out some things about the West, and maybe uh, even though he wasn't president by that time, he was still he was he he was inquiring about you know goods routes to the West, and supposedly Lincoln went up on the, the bluff and looked out over the Missouri River across to the Nebraska side. But as far as we know, he he never actually stepped in Nebraska. He also spoke in Council Bluffs at that time. I think the Council Bluffs papers, which we have some of, I think we have them on microfilm that cover this period. I think he also spoke in St. Joseph or some places in Missouri and maybe Kansas. I, I'm not an expert on that. Maybe somebody here knows, but he was out here before he became president and just looked over the country, basically. We're pretty much done, I think. Well, thank you very much for your attention and uh, enjoy having you.